Welcome to the two month review. Actually, welcome to an old episode of the two month review. So, as you may know, if you follow the 3% blog or uh, the two month review Twitter or Chad Post, myself, my Twitter, um, we are going to be launching the next season of the two month review in May. And it will feature, it will focus on the third volume of Rodrigo Frazan's amazing trilogy that consists of the invented part, the dream part, and now the remembered part. Um, the Remembered Part is a giant and incredible book, very rich, very fulfilling in terms of summing up and completing the trilogy. But before we dive into it, it felt like a good idea to try and remind everyone what happened in the first two volumes. The very first volume, The Invented Part, was the very first season of the two-month review. So to celebrate Rodrigo, to emphasize his importance to both Open Letter and this podcast and everything else... I thought we would rerun all of the episodes from the Invented Part season and the Dream Part season, giving anyone who hasn't heard them before a chance to listen to them, but also anyone who's interested in joining up in this next season, focusing on the third volume of the trilogy, this could be a good refresher. I personally think I need it. My brain is just mush these days. So enjoy your re-listen or first listen to all of these forthcoming two month review podcasts subscribe to us like us on youtube like us on uh apple or whatever you do there you rate things like us follow us on twitter we're at two month review and have fun rodrigo is a blast his books are wild and i'm sure you're going to enjoy all of this Hey, welcome back to the two month review. Ignore everything that happened before. Um, we are trying to get this all going again. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and this is our weekly podcast in which we take one big book, one difficult book, break it down bit by bit, section by section, talk about it, analyze it, have jokes about it, have fun. Today I was going to complain a lot, but now that I've been kicked off of, of StreamYard, I'm no longer angry. I'm just disappointed thoroughly in the fact that that we didn't get a book on the any next list after they being like my only dream for the year. And I have no dreams left now that COVID has ruined society and everything. And that was the last hope. So my last hope is gone. I have all dark from here on out. Um, that's that. This season, we're doing The Dreamed Part by Rodrigo Frezan, which is available on our website. Um, it is uh, available as an ebook for $3.99 at this moment in time, a dollar of which will go to support independent bookstores. We had been giving it away to encourage you people to all join and watch us, but we are no longer doing that. It was a short, limited time thing only. And today on this episode, we're going to cover pages 112 through 155, which is the beginning two sections of the second part of the book, The Other Night, Irrational Catalog for an Exhibition of Restless Shadows. And as always, I am joined by Brian Wood, who is the author of Joy Time Killbox. And how are you doing, Brian? Oh, fantastic, Chad. I couldn't be better to be illegal to be as good as I am. <laughs> the better question is, how are you? I'm not good. Good. That's I'm not here. good. I'll do one bit for, for posterity that I had to teach. I have to teach on Zoom constantly, like every day. And I've been on the phone today since 10 a.m., um, most of which was not necessarily positive or negative. It was just there. But when I was teaching my class, we are getting our kitchen redone right now. Our landlord's redoing it. So as I was trying to teach my class, I'm trapped in a room, in the smallest room, quietest room in the house. Um, meanwhile, my cat's in there with me going, meow, meow, like as loud as he can. And when he's not doing that, there's literally drilling and sawing. So I'm like yelling at my students. I was like, Amazon is bad. And like, they're like, what? And they're just like little heads that are floating on screens and you don't know how to read the room or interact with them. It's like, it's trippy as shit. Um, teaching online in that way, and that's breaking me very fast. As is, as is, as is the ABA not putting one of our books on the any next list. As is the fact that Rodrigo's agent yelled at me the other day. As is the fact that 
people keep sending me books and demanding that we, since I have so much spare time, I read their submissions, as is everything. Like, ah, I don't know that I can make it through this, guys. I don't know that I can make it through this crisis. How you doing, Patrick? Oh, I'm back. doing. I'm doing okay. Um, I'm trying to get a dog off of me right now. So I'll introduce you properly. Special guest, Patrick or P.T. Smith, dog walker extraordinaire, former bookseller, runner of the Best Translated Book Award, which was announced today of the long list, and uh, fellow international literature enthusiast. Thank you for Hi. coming on. Sure. Um, but yeah, no, I think I'm good. I mean, this uh, it's, it's a weird time, but I've been making the best out of it and kind of reading a lot and um, walking a lot with some dogs. And uh, finishing up stuff for the Best Translated Book Award. I was um, impressed with the judges' ability to stay focused and, and kind of hash out the long list uh, during the kind of crisis we're in the middle of and being able to stick to it and get it together. So that was cool, and it was really fun to have it out there. It's a you know, thing that I've been a fan of for – it's been around for 13 years. I've probably been following it for 10 and then, you know, intensely following it for, you know, a few shorter, a few little fewer years than that. And then involved the last like five or six. Um, so it's, yeah. it's one of my favorite things out there. So I'm excited that we got to get it out today. That's awesome. Thank you for all the hard work that you've done over all those years sure. in making this happen. As I remember, even the beginning years, it's like wrangling cats or whatever your appropriate <laughs> thing. Um, uh, but uh uh, and it can be tough, but it's a lot of work because the long lists are very long, like 25 yes. titles, 10 poetry titles. That's a yeah. lot of books. And then the narrow it's a lot of books. Top. I mean, the judges do more work, honestly, which is why I sort of switch from this, like from being a judge to kind of coordinating it. I um, And also kind of why book selling isn't always my favorite thing. I like to read what I want to read when I want to read it. Um, and this, this, uh, being locked in my home is kind of letting me really explore that. Like, I'm just kind of like, I will now read this book that like I probably wasn't going to get to otherwise, but I have all this extra time. I may as well do something with it. That's way better than me. I've just been getting drunk and watching ancient aliens. Um, I Come to find out at two in the morning. That is my jam. It'll go <laughs> really bad. If I start getting drunk, um, my, my hangovers are, are um, exquisitely existentially painful. Um, like, I mean, I just three beers and I'm going to wake up and be like, my body feels fine. My, my brain is telling me I want to die. Um, in well, my according soul. to ancient, according to ancient aliens, you probably have an R type, um, an R negative blood type, which could be linked to the Atlanteans for about 10,000, mm -hmm. 5,000, uh, 10, 10 and a half thousand years ago, oh, which is also I definitely alien can trace back to the Atlanteans. <laughs> so you, you might have Atlantean DNA, which is Absolutely. causing the hangover. Yeah. This is where this is where your world goes. This, this is why Rodrigo's book is perfect for me right now because I'm just like, yep, I'm I'm on board. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> That's why my hangovers are totally fine. I'm just like, <laughs> like I'm an alien. I'm yeah. not a, I'm an Atlantean at all. I'm just other. That's why that's why things don't work out for me. <laughs> In the world. Uh, is your um, screen flickering really fast? By the way, is mine flickering? Okay, it's just me, or I'm okay. insane. You're just, we're all losing it. I mean, I've told you, Chad, but all I've listened to for the last two weeks, music wise, is either classical music or The Grateful Dead, who I never listened to before this. So I, we're all in different ways, completely losing it, but it's happening. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. happening. <sighs> but we're here. It's for the best. Yep. We're all here. Yeah. Um, in space. So for the best turns of the book award, we're not. We're not doing, I asked for the for listeners, long time listeners, short time listeners, who cares? Any listener, but there's none of you right Are now. There any? Matter. Um, the other podcast, I asked Tom Roberts if he wanted to do a uh, 3% podcast. He's just like, why? <laughs> I don't know when, when we'll have a chance to talk about the best translated book awards other than this. Um, so okay. My question for you is, um, the, the list is available. I just posted it in the comments. Mm -hmm. On the millions, who announces this every every year, and they announce the long list, short list, and the winners. Um, and there are, as I said, 25 long list uh, fiction titles, 10 long listed um, short uh, poetry titles. But the a few of them are like obvious, or not obvious, but like to be expected. So I'll just read off a couple yeah. of the Vernon Subutex by Virginie Dupont, uh, translated from the French by Frank Wynne. 
Um, E.G. by Dasha Dernich, uh, translated from the Croatian by Celia Hawksworth. Space Invaders by Nona Fernandez, translated from the Spanish by Natasha Wimmer, which was on the National Book Awards um, shortlist. Uh, Dying, Will and Testament by Vigdis Horth from the Norwegian by Charlotte Barsland. That was a, a National Book Award one too. Um, I'm not sure if the other ones are like really, uh, though The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa, that's a common one that was translated by Steven Snyder that got a lot of, has gotten a lot of attention. And Olga Tokarczyk's uh, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, translated from the Polish by Antonio Lloyd-Jones. Those have all gotten named to other prizes. So like they've been on the Pan Booker or the National Book Award finalists um, or like other prizes that are like, that are compatible. So what about so putting those aside for the moment, all of which are great books. Were there any from the judges, Patrick, that surprised you that made the list? Either um, or like we're just like, oh wow, this is a this is a really interesting book to have made it this far. Stalingrad seemed to come out of nowhere. Interesting. Um I would say Parade is one of the ones where um it kind of surprised me because it seemed like people were like there are often books where it seems like a lot of people liked but are still a little mixed on like they're like oh i like it but probably not enough for the long list and usually one of those books ends up making it to the long list and, and i think parade was one of the ones this year where like people are talking about it but it doesn't seem like they're fully for it and then suddenly enough of people like feel that way that it, it carries over um, so that was a little bit of a surprise in a weird way. Animalia was cause there were, you know, some passionate people for it and then some indifferent people for it, but it, uh, it still swung through, um, total not surprised is Charco making it. People were very excited about Charco being around. I was going to mention that one. Um, cause I wrote about it, uh, die my love, but, um, but it was one that like, I think it was on maybe the Republic of consciousness prize or it had, it, there okay. was attention that was paid to it, but it was not a translation prize. So I figured it, I'd let you bring it up. But yeah, that I'm not surprised by that book either. Um, the book's great. Like I, I, I wrote a whole long thing about it. I don't really remember anymore because that was pre COVID time, which means that yeah. it was not real time. No, nothing. Well, I mean, I, this is the not real time. I don't know, man. This is the new real time. Uh, I feel like I told my students this when I was losing my mind today. <clears throat> every step of the the worst part of this of this of this crisis is that everything that we implement is taking us one step further away from reality. That we're just mediating reality further and further and further to the point where like most people on Zoom now are using like you can change your background so it can be a fake background or a picture yeah. or whatever. It's a fake background. So now I had like one student at the end was playing around with this and he had like the Chinese flag behind his floating face. And so he's no longer in his house. Like I could see him in his house and then I could see him not in like this world in which he's like, like a total, like he's totally just a speaking head, like an avatar. And I was like, this yeah. is, this is taking us one step further away from everything. Yeah. Patrick, cut your hair. <laughs> when it, this is a comment from a, a listener says, wow, Patrick, you haven't cut your hair in at least two weeks. <laughs> I just I just figured out how to see the comments. Yeah, no, my hair is um I honestly like before this all happened, I was like, you know, first like real warm day, I'm gonna go get my hair cut. And then the first warm day didn't come and now you're not allowed to get your hair. I I listen to the Grateful Dead to keep thoughts of shaving my head at bay. Because otherwise I just think about shaving my head and I don't want to shave my head. So out of the out of the cosmic DNA lottery of hair growth, like I'm the clear loser out of this group. And yet, like, as this goes on, my hair is gonna get longer and puffier and wavier and weirder. And I'm just <laughs> giving up. Like, I never care about how I look really. Like, I don't care about clothing generally. Like, I'd rather not have to deal with clothing if at all possible. Like, I don't want to <laughs> fit it and look nice or do anything that's good. I just rather just like have clothes so I can exist. I don't give a shit. But I tend to try and keep track of my hair. And this is gonna put me over the edge one step further. I'm mean, gonna have like this weird flowing like waviness in this giant bald spot and like to go along with like my aging body and uh, the fact that I'm just deteriorating my liver by the moment, then this is gonna be great. Oh. Uh, you want it to be dark, Patrick. I'm giving you what you want. Did I say dark? I think I just said funny. I think I just said funny. I, I led with funny. Um, <laughs> Do we want to try to find a way to segue to the book? Yeah, one second. Brian, did you have you looked at the best trends of the book or long list? I know you probably haven't read a ton of the books, but I don't know if there are any that jumped out at you. There's one other one I want to bring up. Yeah, I, 
I thought that book 77 was trash. The cover was ugly. I don't know why somebody would publish it in the first place. What is that even doing there? Fuck that book. <laughs> that book is definitely not an indie next pick. I'll tell you that. <laughs> definitely not on any ADA radar. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't really like lists are fun and it's fun to like argue over and stuff, but I, I don't really have usually really strong opinions one way or the other. Cause I don't understand how something wins or how something loses sometimes. Cause a, a lot of times there's so much stuff that has merit that didn't make it. There's yeah. stuff that maybe you're kind of questioning that did like yeah. you can go either way. You can oh. go either way with it. So it's just kind of fun to fill up some, some time and to give recognition. I'm just glad, I'm just glad we're talking about smaller presses, uh, tra um, international literature, like anything that's, Encouraging that, I think, is fantastic. So no, I'm all for that. The ones that the yeah. ones when when a when a prize feels like it's like top loaded or like or like tipping. Yeah, yeah. Like Our yo, it's like that's the ones I'm like, this is dumb. But this list doesn't feel like that at all. But there are two books no, I want to mention out of that. Um, one is the boy. Special shout out to Emma Ramadan and Tom Marberish for having a hell yeah. Love so them. I wanted to mention that, and the other one I wanted to mention was um. World editions having uh, "Welcome to America" mm -hmm. by Linda Bostrom Pranasgard, translated yeah. by Martin Aiken on there because I don't think that Carl Ove Knosgard's book six was on the long list at all. I think it was, or oh, maybe it was two years ago because it was. So, like, go Linda, go World Edition. Yes, I'm happy about it. But the only reason. The only reason I'm, I'm saying I think it was is because a former judge is writing her Why This Book Should Win post on um, Welcome to America. And she said that part of the reason she wants to do it is to atone for helping uh, Carl get on there one year. But I, also um, didn't, I don't remember it. So I, I don't honestly don't know. There's just there's a lot of books every year. So I do to remember them all. Yeah, I have one last comment about that. And then let's move on to, to Rodrigo's book. The well, last comment about that is that... Um, the only source of, of institutional memory about the Best Translated Book Award is the Wikipedia page that's set up for it, which somebody maintains. I don't know who that person yeah. is, um, but whoever it is, thank you. Continue doing yes. it because I Please. do it. And it's I use it to check to see where things are. Yeah. Yep. I use it, especially like, you know, if I want to say, you know, this publisher is their first time or this language is first time on there. That's always been a really it's, useful way to check that. Yeah. And uh, I, did, I didn't do it. To yesterday because just it's a weird time and I'm not always focused. But uh, I mean, we have a book from Malay and Iban. That might be the first time. I'm not sure, but that's pretty cool. Two books from Arabic because that's often something people don't uh, see on the list enough. And there's yeah. a lot of reasons for that. I think um, a, a lot of reasons why we don't see very many Arabic books on the list. But this year's got two, which is great. Yep. So okay, so cool. Let's put aside the best times of book award. I, the short list will be announced in a number of weeks. The long list yeah. will be announced. Everything's virtual. Everything's maybe we'll have a virtual announcement of the of both of these things. We could do that through the millions or through yeah. or whatever. Um, so yeah, but it's good. I'm glad that it that it's happening right now. It'll give you something to distract myself, and we'll be running. Yeah. Why did this? Why this book should win? Posts um, for all of these books, if at all possible. I think we have most of it set up, but if you be sure and reach out because get some more people to write for it. Um, let's talk about Freyzan's The Dream Part. So we move this time. Last week, we had the last two episodes covered the first section of the book in which the writer is talking about his dreams and about how he still has dreams and that they've been doing research on dreams with led to the lack of them. And suddenly, the second part makes a big change. And we are in a new perspective, a new voice, and a new sort of setup. And I almost think that it might be worth taking this one bit by bit because it is like, as we say we do, but like in a more bit by bit section, because I think it's, I think it's a real curveball as you, as you started to get your footing at the end of part one and then walk into this, it's going to be like disorienting. Um, and I, and I think maybe walking through it might help a little bit. Um, but before we do that, what is your general impression of the section that we write today, Patrick? Um, I mean, I think that curveball idea held. I mean, it's definitely is. It's just it's a huge curveball. And I, so, what I was thinking of. Um, so I reread. I've read this book before, um, and now I'm rereading for this. I probably will follow along the whole way, but we'll see. But last night, this morning, I, I read all the way up and through uh, where we're supposed to be today. And going in, I had the the uh, the idea that. Um, 
a, a distinction between this and the invented part is he is less interested in, in you being able to follow along. I, I think um, I often uh, say that Frizan is like a, a nicer Nabokov in that he um, wants you on board. He's not, he's difficult because his ideas are difficult because what he's doing is difficult. He's not making it difficult in order to make it hard for a reader to fuck with a reader, to show a reader that he can bully their intelligence. Um, he wants you to, he wants your intelligence to, to come along and, and, and figure out his intelligence. Nabokov was like, fuck you. I want to show how stupid you are. I want to bully you. I want to tease you. Um, and I felt like the invented part did work to, to help bring you along. Um, whereas this uh, does less of that work. And I feel like that fits something that's supposed to be more dreamlike because you, you don't have a foothold when someone's telling you about a dream or even in your own dream. If, if you are processing your dream or someone else's dream, you don't have uh, context. Context comes up in this section. You don't have the same sort of context and footholds to interpret it and um, uh, understand it as clearly. And so this book kind of operates that same way. You're, you're a little more adrift than in the invented part. And when the section changes, it's like another dream starting. You're just kind of readjusting in a different way. As I say, it's almost like the difference between writing and dreaming. Yeah. If yes. this is all about how you write, this one's about how you dream. Yeah. Hey, Brian, what do you think? Uh, I liked it. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'm not super familiar with the Bronte sisters. So that's something I want to go back and like go go deeper into. Yeah, but somehow I feel like I'm going to. Um, but uh, I, I really just kind of dug in and enjoyed um, the transition from dreams to to night and light and the play of light and dark in this. Uh, I thought was a really fun um, transition. Um, and in the same way where we learned about the the karmas, I, I get the same feeling with the like the myth of the tulpas and yeah. like this just bizarre like the bizarreness of this family. So it was yeah. it was familiar but but strange, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think this is called a teaser, but we can end this whole discussion on uh, of this episode with a good blowjob joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure. We'll get there. <laughs> as as Frazan would say, more of that to come. Where did that to come? Bad book can lead to a good one. So, yeah. You know. yeah. Why don't you want to learn more about the Bronte sisters? No, I do. Um, oh, you I'm, you just, do. I'm very. Yeah, I, I haven't read much of them. Okay. Um, and the last time I did read from them was uh, in my undergrads. So would have been like 2001, maybe. So it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, but it just it feels so important to this. Like I, I feel like I yeah. have to patch that. I have to patch that gap in my in my knowledge to really appreciate what's going on. I mean, what, um, I, I was just, fortunate enough to know a little bit about um, Spitzgerald to yeah. to hang in there in the last one, and this one's like, oh, I'm drowning. So I need to. I better. I, I have I have a little bit of time on my hands. I could probably read a couple Bronte books. So. <laughs> well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna. So for anyone listening that like might be worried about that, there's two things that will happen. One is that there's an explanation of like the Bronte sisters and their their fam familial relations yeah. and like how they're how they functioned as a family, especially relations their dad. With it, um, and about each one of them biographically. But the only book that's focused on is Wuthering Heights. Right. And it's and it's. Ex it's, it's yeah. explained in incredible detail. Like yeah. I it carries you along, school, but like I got all of it. I, all right, I'll just Wikipedia I, it then. Fine. Yeah. Wikipedia. I kind of loved all the Wuthering Heights <laughs> stuff. Um, I had uh, I I read read Wuthering Heights in high school and college. Um, didn't like it in high school. Um, and in college, I, I, I loved it. I read it in a, in a course as two professors who changed my reading life in a, in a really wonderful way. And um, they had they, we read Wuthering Heights. And in, in, in um, high school, we definitely read it as like a realist romance, British romance novel thing. Where everything's straightforward and you're just following this romance plot and whatever. Um, and then it wasn't until I had it in college where they were like, you guys know how weird this fucking book is, right? Like, you guys know this book is really, really, really weird? Like, very strange. Like, nothing like it, especially at its time. Um, and so that really changed my, my take on the book, and I ended up loving it. And I was, it was just 
thing where a lot of the classics didn't get it. They still were like, either it's a dumb romance I don't care about, or it's a great romance and I care about it. There was like a smaller group of people who were like, I like this weird fucking book. Is Heathcliff a monster? What is this? Um, and uh, I like that Frazan has a, has, has a similar approach to like the way my teachers taught it. Like that, the recognizing that this book is, is unique. It's a totally strange, unique book. It's not what people who want to watch the movie adaptations and dream of Heath, Heathcliff think of. Like it's yeah. something else. Yeah, he leans into like what the weirdnesses are. It's sort of yeah. like in, in the last, in uh, the invented part, when he talks about the final Nabokov book, the, um, oh shoot, is it Transparent Things? Yeah. The, the Transparent Things and about how that is a very strange book. Very and then I read that, I was like, oh my God, you're right. This book, like you could just read it and be like, okay, it's fine. But the second yeah. you pick at it, you're like, wait a second, what's oh, happening here? And Wuthering Heights has that. I remember, I have a very visual and visceral memory of reading that in high school and those versions where it was like a hardcover that was like a mass market book, but like made into a hardcover, like library bound with like weird um, plastic on top of it. And when you open it, the spine would crack and all the pages were yellowed. And that's up. are you literally smoking weed on our podcast? You were smoking, you were <laughs> drinking whiskey. You. <laughs> you were drinking whiskey. <laughs> have your whiskey. Oh <laughs> we have we have definitely entered a new phase of casual on this podcast. It's the end of the world. What are we supposed Patrick, to do? Patrick, that's still that's still no, by the way, still look, illegal. No, it's, it's not. still illegal in New York. It's, it's illegal. Not illegal. I'm, 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 am, I am I in New York? <laughs> Am I no, but we York? are. Now we feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I made you feel bad. I I, joke, I was joking to myself about just you're like gosh, really bedraggled with like a one hitter hanging out of my mouth. <laughs> like, fuck it, guys. <laughs> this is yes. it's over. But I don't think I can get into any characters right now, um, <laughs> at all. Dude, he looks like John. He looks like John the Baptist. And he's listening to Grateful Dead. You really give a fuck <laughs> if he's taking a hit? Like, come on. <laughs> Calm down. I mean, it, but it makes it makes for great like podcasting. Like the fact that nobody can sure. see you. <laughs> I'm, I'm just doing a bit. And this also, a bit. This bit doesn't <laughs> work as for audio. It's not the first time. I've, it's just the first time on video. You, know, you haven't noticed on audio. That would be super funny if this was the first time you ever smoked weed. That would be the <laughs> if you were just That's like I smoke weird, weed for the first time. Weird on time to video. start. Okay, so. The first part is where is the part that is the very left turn, in my opinion. Like chapter one of this, like page one nineteen. I have a yeah. thing written down that the writer equals dreams of Penelope equals darkness, and this is leading us into the darkness. So it has two things that are worthwhile mentioning on the first page. I think one is that it keeps talking about the light making the darkness and contrasting those two and emphasizing and leaning into the darkness light dichotomy, but in favoring the darkness, which is usually not favored. Like you're usually always like, then there was light, the light is good, the darkness is bad. And this is being like, why? Mm -hmm. Darkness is perfectly fine. But right there in the middle of 119 is weathering, which is a word that you would never see. And except if you're going to reference weathering heights. Yeah. He's like, so good. It's so good. And then on this first section on page 120, the other thing that's really key is that, um, that there is the reference to her bad brother's bad influence. So at the like near the fourth paragraph from the end, or after all the foregoing, she finally sets aside the recurrent and oh so fraternal, her bad brother's bad influence, mania of turning everything into part of an enumerative list where there's nothing left to stain black. And so the light resorts to the most time-honored and easy and personal and primitive way of unmasking the light to let there be darkness, closing its eyes. So at that point, we know that this is Penelope. Like if you're paying attention, that is, this is now Penelope. The bad brother is the writer, yeah. and the sister is Penelope. Who, <laughs> end of not the end of the invented part, but in her section, the invented part has fled after lighting her house on fire when the young writer and the woman that he loved were trying to do a biography on her brother and are camping in their yard. She lights her house on fire, leaves into the forest, and is gone. And she had a son, the son that she had with the uh, um, mantra who is presumed to be dead at the time in the, in the invented part, is presumed to have, have to be dead and that possibly she has killed him. If I remember correctly, someone want to correct me on that, go for it. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but, but I think that that's what's happening. Okay, 
So now we're now Penelope's here, and that Penelope would be the speaker for this section, which I think is important because if we don't key in on that, this would be really confusing. Correct. Yes. Um, and is he it, likes. And is it taking place in a sanatorium? Yes. Or, yes, and that is mentioned in a few pages too. Um, yeah. So she's there. To, about the darkness. Here comes the darkness, here overhead, following the night. And with the darkness and with the night, she lights up. Here her dream is life. Stella de Or shines, splendid terrorist, immortal dead star. Her black light reaching us after so many years of being snuffed out. Um, <clears throat> so this is the other character that's going to happen here, is Stella de Or, which is an invented character that we'll find out later is like, cannot be in sunlight is like so she has to live in the darkness her skin is almost translucent and if the sun touches her she has a rare disease that's a real disease that if the sun touches her she will like essentially burn and scar and that so she has to live in darkness so in contrast to the right oh, it's called that's called being that disease called being english <laughs> yeah, fuck you great <laughs> that's a great thing no but she's no, and it's it interesting too because they mentioned her as being like unblemished, right? Like there's not a single, like it's just pure skin. There's not even a mark, a yeah. freckle, a mole, nothing. Nothing. Um, so she's and, she's with like with yeah. And to jump ahead and try and frame this, so she is living in darkness because of like a crazy story that we'll get to, and then there are going to be a family of three sisters that are trying to write her story and are arguing about writing her story, and they live on the moon. Um, yeah, where, where else would you write it? I don't know, man. It's Mars. With brother Birdie. Brother, Bur brother, oh, Birdie. brother Birdie. Hey, Birdie. <laughs> brother Birdie. Brother Birdie. Like I feel like I feel like I'm gonna dress up as Brother Birdie for Halloween. Where is Halloween? Could you imagine Halloween happening? I guess, no, no way. Just a just a dead person in a spacesuit with no helmet. <laughs> <laughs> what would that? What would that? <laughs> oh man, that'd be a weird costume. That'd be cool. I'm That's there. actually an awesome costume. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So okay, so we got that sort of set up. So then we get the long bit, which has this interesting reference um, on pages. So it says like, uh, "Her resplendent voice still audible, like an echo reverberating against galaxies, saying things like." And there's a long quote that begins with, "You may say I'm a dreamer," which I suppose we should all sing, sort of, that so we can be like. Uh, the the famous celebrities who sang it on the YouTubes or whatever they did. Um, no, I don't know what you're that's talking about. That's in my book. About. That's in my book notes right now. That stupid celebrity video. Uh -huh. <laughs> also, you know what will make people feel better is if like a bunch of we're like super rich and living in the hills. Let's just sing to them <laughs> from our mansions in the hills. <laughs> One of my students complained that Ellen DeGeneres had some video where she was like crying about how hard it is to be stuck in her house. And uh, and they were just like, "Fuck you, fuck her, <laughs> fuck her so goddamn much." <laughs> I mean, have have kids, <laughs> like <laughs> every parent out there, every parent who hears this, you are doing the Lord's work. This is impossible. Well, or be a Lord like, and don't know when another human being will ever touch you. Yeah, that too. Yes, everyone survives. It's called high. That sounds to me like high school, but all right. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty used to it, so it's like not a particular challenge. It's just, you know. I mean, but at least in high school, it was okay if you knew you were going to touch yourself. Not right. sure. <laughs> but the, here's how terribly out of touch uh, celebrities are. Like, just, just another example. Like, there's people are scared, like – you know, we're all gonna know somebody that loses a loved one or something, and like trying to deal with that. And then, like the first line, imagine there's no heaven. Well, then where'd my nana go? Because I'm fucking pissed right now. Like, thanks a lot. <laughs> I didn't even get to see her because she. You know, I couldn't go near her without getting contagious yeah. myself. Yeah. <laughs> um. So thanks, thanks, Gal Gadot. I feel so good. I think we should make a new rule that Patrick. Every time you say something that you feel is. Pot influence crazy. Understatement <laughs> thing like, but I'm just high. Uh, okay, <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen because I'm gonna I, I'm I'm gonna stay on topic. Um, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we've done a great job of that so far. 
Yeah, I know. That was a, that was an attempt to segue back to it. All yeah. I wanted to add to the the bits you read from were um, a thing that makes as much as you uh, you feel more adrift at this in this one than in the invented part. Um, how good of a writer he is, like on a sentence level, on the sound level, on just like having beauty in his words, uh, helps you get through this. Like you're just like, okay, I don't know what you meant right there, but boy, the sounds of those words really made me enjoy that page. Like I'm a little lost, but like there's real pleasure happening on the page here. Double shout out to Will Vanderheiden for doing Yes. That. Cause like, yes. yeah, it would be easy. This is the sort of writing where it's easy to get lost and to think that you're just, you're just making something pretty that might mean something, but like, you're not going to worry about it. But I don't, but, but Will doesn't operate like that. And the book isn't yeah. trying to that. I've, I've seen those books before. Um, and then, this I, I see a lot of times um, on some, like I, I read the Asymptote Slush Pile, a lot of times on that, um, what is Brian doing? Physical comedy is great for a podcast, uh, guys. That's, that's, my, that's my daughter, she's trying to poke It makes more sense now, once I, yeah, yeah. Um, a cardboard tube. I thought it was just a giant joint. <laughs> that's what I, I thought it's he was actually, trying to make fun of me in some way that I didn't get. No, if you wanna know how weird You're this, just this is, um, the the truth of why I have this tube is because we've been wrapping Christmas presents, our birthday presents, for an octopus's birthday that we had yesterday. We were pretending. And so we ran out of wrapping paper, and so now we have a tube because of an octopus birthday. That's I'm gonna, the truth. I'm gonna, I did not make that up. I'm going to straight up steal a note, but I'm doing it. So have either of you watched all of Avenue 5? No. One of my favorite jokes at the end is there's this like, HR guy who's running this ship <laughs> in space that's like, gone off track and is going to be taking years to get back home and everyone's losing their minds. And it's like an Elon Musk sort of stand up in some ways and like various other things. But this HR guy is supposed to be like, you know, the together keeping everyone positive and he like loses his shit and tells everyone everything's a simulation and a bunch of people kill themselves. And then he's like, he's like depressed. He's like, I've been writing to my thoughts. He's like thought 14. He's like, poor octopus, eight arms, no hand. Fuck you, God. <laughs> I, I was telling Kay, I was telling my wife Katie the other day that uh, I'm pretty sure Donald Trump just pulled the move off of Avenue Five, where it's like they told me it was going to be two million, but I negotiated it down to hundred to yeah. two hundred fifty thousand. Yay me! <laughs> 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 Avenue Five. And like the, there's the one guy that went, wait, why are you negotiating how many days it takes to get home? That doesn't work like that. <laughs> Like he literally did that in the Rose Garden, man. It's like, what the hell? We're, this is. I wish this was some, like something we could laugh at more. But this is. This isn't funny. What no. are you doing? This is no longer funny, guys. I don't know that it's funny. So, anyway, so one of the things about this section where she's talking though that's interesting is the very bottom on 121: a bottomless sky, a deep pool from which to extract stories in which to weave the pot of the constellations, a house of extraterrestrial gods and alien divinities. I want for the night to be the novel that follows the bedtime story your parents read to you. And after you live throughout the long night, though your eyes are shut yet so far, yet so near reading it, though you don't know yet how to read it. I want for the night to not just to be another hour on the clock, but another time altogether elsewhere. And this, the bottomless sky, the bottom of the sky being one of Rodrigo's book feels like a nice reference there. And this idea of it being like, of the night being an alternate, almost alternate universe, alternate time, alternate way of being, is sort of setting it up as not not in contrast to dreams, but another aspect of dreams. And that's where like, if the invented part is like the writerly aspect of this trilogy, this is kind of that nebulous, dark, amorphous part of it. Like if you're trying to, if the whole thing's set up to figure out how books come to, how art comes to be, you have the one side where it's the craftiness and invented part is super crafty, right? Like it, you get to see like how the pieces come together <laughs> and like how everything, all the puzzle gets made. And here you feel like he's trying to tap into the undercurrent, the parts that we don't control that are like, what happens when you dream or when it's night, when you're not in control anymore, after you've heard a story and then you go dark, like what then happens that is the magic, the, the part that like then you process and create a, a story out of. And I'm gonna tell you guys, I had a dream last night that um, I, was taking, I had to take a Delkey intern to Europe right now in the middle of this crisis 
to have these editorial meetings. And um, and it was a Delkey Archive intern specifically. And I was told by Edwin Frank of the New York Review of Books that this Delkey intern, he knew, and he was like, oh yeah, he was raised as a goldfish. So you need to be careful with him. And I thought that's the, I woke up and was like, that's the most amazing insult I think I've ever dreamt is that he was raised as a goldfish. Raised as a, raised as a goldfish. I like the <laughs> But it feels cutting. You're, you're going to find a moment in your life where you're like, no, this is what it means. I can tell this person you were raised by a goldfish. And it will it raised, raised, raised as a goldfish. Raised as a goldfish, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do it. It is better. So we get a little bit about Stella there afterwards. Um, and then we have all this bit about like whether or not like Stella says is true or not, or the historian who's writing them. And we get a lot of references to the fact of like that this is Penelope. All the clues on like page 124 are like the clues that this is Penelope. That her another bad brother's bad influences. She's also a writer, so on and so yeah. forth. Um, that she hates Thomas Ella Edison. Um, there's the great Karl Marx quote. Um, but then we get to 126, and this is an important turning point, I think. And 126 is where it says that isn't the tone she wants for this. That tone is already known, already been heard. The sister tells her three other sisters with, yes, an accusatory tone. A tone that reminds her, the chronicle of the comings and goings of Silda or of the grim and grating tone of her grim and grating bad older brother. And it feels like this is an attempt at this moment to try and make it not written the way that the writer was writing. And to, to establish something else for Penelope's way of telling her particular story. So do you think that success is it ends up being ends up being a successful attempt or does it I think the attempt is not here. I think the attempt is coming. I think it's okay. indicating the, the desire for an attempt to do something that's not that. That that has that voice exists. That the idea of like enumerating these lists of creating all these like all of the tricks of the invented part and of, of the dream part so far that the writer uses are very They've been done. They've been they've been circled through. It would be easy to fall into that pattern and the attempt to try and break that pattern to some degree. And I'm going to hypothesize wildly here and say that um, that that's that one of the things that happens sort of happens at the bottom of the sky too to like break out of that mold of writing is that there's a play that goes on in Frazine's work with viewpoints and and secondary viewpoints. So we have Penelope talking about Stella. And then in the next bit, we're gonna get Stella's story being written by three tulpas on the moon. So you then by switching the perspective to their perspective writing about Stella, but knowing that Penelope's really the one that's in charge of this, that triangulation allows for a distance that gives them a new point of view to write something that's different. Right. I feel like someone else should talk a lot. I feel like I've been on all day. <laughs> I mean, you're, but you are very on on this. And part of what I'm struggling is you, it sounds like you, you, you are talking past this point a decent amount, right? Like where we are in the book. A little bit. Yeah. So like, it's cause like, I am not seeing there's, there's definitely a different style to this, to the invented part so far, but it still is a lot of, there's probably more similarities than difference while still being different because I think the inventor part is more structured when you're crafted is the word you use that I really responded to. That's an incredibly crafted book, like mm -hmm. the level of everything being planned out and the pieces working together is perfectly detailed. Um, and this definitely already is looser. Um, and I, I honestly can't remember where it goes from here. So how much it fits into your theory and how much it doesn't. Would you say this is more of the Grateful Dead compared to the, or this is more of, yeah, this is more of the Grateful Dead compared to the Beatles? The Grateful Dead compared to um, Pearl Jam. <laughs> Pearl Jam is like very much a very specific format. <laughs> I don't know. Dude, my kids, the guy in our kitchen listens to 90s rock constantly. And I heard Crackers Low the other day, and I was like, this is the pinnacle of 90s music writing. <laughs> where, like, the, the, the chorus is, Hey, hey, hey! It's like being stoned. I was like, "Yeah, God." You, um, <laughs> Pearl Jam's not complicated enough, I guess. Pink. Let's say Pink Floyd. The like, inventor oh. is Pink Floyd. It's, Pink, it's, it's, Pink Floyd, and this is uh, the Grateful Dead. 
Honestly, I'm going to say that works because this, um, the references, um, the constant stream of references in, in the invented part um, almost felt like a, a tick, like a, a crafted and, and, and perfected, but an involuntary tick. When they're inv they feel also at times involuntary here, but in a more subconscious way, in a more just, they just crop up. Yeah. And then they kind of crop up again. Like there's a little moment that I, I it's at the end of the section and I, I love it a, a lot because it, it tells you how often he's using references and how easily you could miss them. Like he just throws them in there so smoothly, so involuntarily for him that they're just, they're part of this consciousness that uh, it's hard to catch them um, sometimes. But on 151, um, mm -hmm. uh, midway down, and that he has seen things like he wouldn't believe and that he'll never let them be lost like tears and rain. Now, most people are going to get that. Like, absolutely, without a doubt, most people are going to get that. But the next page... What is it? Back that's uh, Rutger, that's Rutger what? Hauer in the, Hitchhike, in the Hitcher, the Hitchhiker movie. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering where you were going to go. I'm like, I know Brian's going to get this wrong, but exactly how is he going to get this wrong? Okay, he's starting right, but oh, there we go. Okay. But the next page, he returns to the reference, expands it, like does, and then does something different with it. And and it, I don't know. That I, I like how uh, these gestures come about in this book, and there, there are ways it's similar to the invented part, but it's also it's faster. It's a lot faster. Um, Everything's a faster. There's a lot more information coming at you. Yes. Really this quick. book is way quicker. It's not being meted out in a way that you can structure it. Like it, it's it's un it's like deconstructed information in a way that I don't mean to sound postmodern, <clears throat> but to sound like it's just it's un it's undemarcated. So like in the invented part, we had each one of those chapters was like very specifically achieving mm -hmm. a piece. And in this, there's an intent to like disrupt that normal flow. That then and to do something that's like more of a oh God, I don't want to keep using Grateful Dead reference, but it's more jam bandy in a sense that it's just like going, but it is way crafted. Like it's very oh, obviously. obviously. He just, he's hiding the craft like, a little bit more. It's just yeah. It's, and um the it's I think it's in the first episode you guys did, but he I mean, it was the second episode. I are you do you have porn tucked in your book, Chad? I have this. <laughs> For anyone who's watching it, this is my note to myself last night. And if anyone can decipher whatever the Tolkien, there they I will give you money. I think it says creatures comes in comfort with tendency. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Um, but in the early on in the book, he he um, starts talking about how much he doesn't like dialogue and he avoids dialogue and he thinks the flaws with it. And then the next however many pages is dialogue. And so like there's a, a jam bandy riff thing to that, but it's done with intentionality of, oh, I'm bad at this. This is a weakness. This is a, a, a way to actually make it different as opposed to some bands that just do the same thing over and over and over and over while thinking they're riffing. Um, like he's, he's changing, but he, he's doing it very uh, aware and crafted. So I'm using that word obsessively now, because I'm stoned. That's fine. There we go. I got it. I got it in. Knew it. So, um, the does anyone want like what you were saying, Chad? Though with um the different perspectives on telling the narratives, like, and I'm I'm I've been trying to process that as we've been talking right now. But then, like, um, like the reference on 123 um, at the <coughs> bottom to the firebombing of Dresden. Yeah. Uh, which is. Slaughterhouse Five and Kurt Vonnegut, and how do you how do you tell a story? How do you tell histories? And it's well, we'll use aliens, and we'll go through time. We'll time travel with aliens, obviously. Like, how else would you tell it, right? And then the idea of like this this story going to a moon base, and like it's just another way of kind of adding another slight like layer or breadcrumb as as to the way that like this isn't going to be a narrative that you're <laughs> used to, or like he could have gone anywhere with it. And he chooses he chooses to use a Kurt Vonnegut reference, yeah. like to, yeah. to slip in a Kurt Vonnegut reference there. And then um, Kurt Vonnegut which, reference is followed by multiple references to her bad brother. Yeah. Mm, who, yeah, that's that's nice. Yeah, um, so trying to set it apart, the opposition of creating the character and the character Penelope, who is a writer, as we'll find out, and a far more successful yeah, I, than the writer. I'm very surprised by that. Is like, yeah, yeah, so, 
Yeah. Do either of you want to recount like Stella Delors' uh, origin story for fun? <clears throat> it's so. I have a take. Something on to it. do with uh, something to do with the words for snow. I'm not sure. <laughs> and her and her amazing father. <laughs> okay, so I've got a take on that. So, um, in the first one, if you remember, in the invented part and in the writer's like biography, his parents are these glamorous. Um, people who go around doing ads, right? And they're like, yeah. they're like superstar ad makers where they go and like, they're, they're beautiful and they go to like various places of the world and they shoot ads for, I forget what, I want to say a cigarette company because I used to have a vision of these cigarette ads that I would make and it was similar to that. <clears throat> but I don't remember if that's true. But they are, they, they're ad people and they're glamorous and they're highly visible. And in this case, Stella Or being a reflect, like an invention, of of Penelope, right? So like she's not a real person. Stellador is not real. She's being her history is being written by Penelope. Let's assume. I guess I don't know. I assume um, that she creates then a father, no mother, but a father who is extremely famous for being able to be a linguist and is so like famous and charming and beautiful and handsome that he hosts Saturday Night Live as a linguist and makes like a linguist. <laughs> Like this and, and his monologue was masterful. Funny <laughs> shit. That's yeah. funny shit. The monologue is always the best part. Yeah, I don't even watch the show anymore, to be honest. But uh, I believe um, the the so she so he's so dad is like masterfully known as like a uh, very beautiful, very handsome linguist who then decides to go off and become like, they refer to him as like the Indiana Jones of linguistics, who wants to go find this special magical word that no one else knows, the new word for snow up on the North Pole, and like is found months later with a baby. And that's Stella Or, and he's protecting her, keeping her from the light. And you get this whole long great bit about like what it is in the Arctic. Like it's only dark for four and a half months, but it's like the gloaming for a certain time. And then it's also like light light for a long time. And he is discovered with this baby. He never speaks again. And she becomes this creature that people want to, this figure, this woman who people want to write about because of her luminescence and her like her specific disease and the fact that she can't see light and that she therefore has like some special sort of story to be told. But Penelope is writing that because it keeps saying like the writer who's writing me, she who is writing me, blah, 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 blah. So or is like not real, right? Yeah. But the dad sort of maps. Like if you take the writer's dad and then reinvent that, like if you were to take like your life experience, if, let's assume that the, the mom and dad of the writer were the mom and dad of Penelope, were these like figures that were like these 60s, amazing, you know, beloved, uh, you know, look, uh, uh, lusted after advertising figures and then dream that. The dream of that could be someone who's like a linguist who's also the the beautiful person that finds a special baby and the special girl, it's only a girl, there's no one else involved. The special girl that everyone's gonna pay attention to is the one that he protects and brings back to the center of like of, of his world. Which yeah, is I, a bit of wish fulfillment too. I, I totally buy Celador as a as a fictional version of 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 Penelope. I mean, much the way, uh, you know, it's easy to find characters that are uh, the writer having a version of himself, or, or the, you know, we see that throughout the whole book. Yes, and that this does sort of like tweak that, right? Like within a it's like second level meta, where like um, if the writer, if Rodrigo's saying the writer is not me, the writer's life is not my life, but it has parallels. Penelope is saying, I'm a writer too, and my writing will not be my life, and it will be this thing. So you've entered into like a fictional character inventing a fictional story for a fictional. Yeah. She's dreaming it. And uh and also it it doesn't the the all the, the light and the luminescence doesn't uh go too far from the desert and the the diamonds in the desert that Penelope finds in, yes. in the invented part, which is also referenced in this section, anyways. Yep. Um, the desert is the is referenced, and and um, and that's another thing. The references um, he starts to reference himself and his the invented part, the way he's referencing the rest of pop culture, it mm. just is there, embedded, and you're finding it 
and stumbling on it. And sometimes he's, you know, really revealing it, but other times it's just kind of sitting there for you. Yeah. One of my favorite bits is the very last sentence. It's not even a sentence. I'm just going to use the phrase that where Stellar or is like, who it is who's writing me in yeah. the last section of this. So in the first part, we had who dreams the dreamer or who's the dreamer dreaming the dream, sort of a Lynchian version. And here we have like, who's the writer writing me? Like, we're getting into a different sort of textual territory of creation again. And I, I really like that phrase for some reason. Like, yeah. it really appeals to me. But um, but yeah, so we put that aside then. And then the second section of this part, <clears throat> which starts on page 140, introduces the three Tulpa sisters, Alex and Charlie and Eddie Tulpa. How, are you guys familiar with the Tulpa stuff? What Tulpas are? No, I know no. I needed to look it up, but I don't okay. remember. Okay, okay. So um, when we were watching Twin Peaks The Return, boom, minute 5320, guys. I mentioned Twin Peaks. So anyone who had 5320 on your board, you win. <clears throat> this week's this week's game of when does Chad talk about Twin Peaks? Um, so they show up. The idea of a tulpa shows up in Twin Peaks The Return. And when it did, Rodrigo emailed me and was like, you'll never believe this, but tulpas are the big, big part of the dream part. And uh, Will sent this section was like, yeah, it's very true. So tulpas, I'll read the Wikipedia because I don't want to fuck this all up. Talpa is a concept in mysticism and the paranormal of a being or object which is created through spiritual or mental powers. It was adapted by 20th century uh, theosophist from Tibetan Sprulpa, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, which means emanation or manifestation. Modern practitioners use the term to refer to a type of willed imaginary friend, which practitioners consider to be sentient and relatively autonomous. So the idea of a talpa is that your idea of a person or thing becomes real and enters into the world. So in Twin Peaks The Return, Dale Cooper's, or um, yeah, there, there can be, well, uh, what's her name? Oh God, Diane um, is a tulpa who's not real, it's just an idea. And there's various people who become ideas that take on physical manifestations, but are an idea of evil, an idea of servitude, an idea of various things, yeah. and that are that functioning in the world, and you wouldn't know that they're not real, but, they, but they're just, idea people and so these three people are the tulpas clearly invented manifestations from i believe penelope's mind and yeah. they are based on the bronte sisters using unisex names for three sisters could also be used as be treated as three men like the brontes had used various students at times too or like george Eliot did obviously but um they that that these are creations of like who's going to tell the stella de or story like if Seldor is a created figure of Penelope, who gets to write her story as the, the way to tell it? And we get one of those here and it's from Eddie. And this is the part that I was alluding to where the Eddie section is a story. So they broadcast in this imaginary world from the moon, they live there and they broadcast stories to earth about Stella de Orr. And Eddie tells a story. Eddie's story is not the writer's ticks. It doesn't have the writer's ticks at all. It doesn't have the enumerated lists. It doesn't have the like more on that later. It doesn't have any of those things. It's like a story about a, an astronaut or like a um, <clears throat> astronaut sun out in like the Sonora desert um, and being on the moon. And it's more about like relationships between parents and children and very much like a stark sort of sci-fi feeling thing. That's not necessarily the self-referential Man manias maniacism that's not a word eh, it is now manias uh, like the self what is it mania the mania of like this mentality in the list making that's not here this is a different sort of writing so when it references that there's going to be a different sort of writing i feel like it's like signaling this section okay yeah and i i i uh, yeah, I buy that. I don't know what to say besides I buy that, that I do think that, like, he is working against his habits while still being himself. You know, Frizan's still doing very much Frizan things in this. Um, the typewriter voice allows him to, you know, continue to do whatever he wants, when he wants. But, like, he is, it does really seem like he's announcing um, what he's going to do and then doing it. Um, but in, a, in sort of a tricky at times way, which is a very Nabokovian thing to do. Like, you know, tell you that he's doing it, tell you he hates dialogue and then do all dialogue or tell you oh, I'm done with lists and then actually avoid lists for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And like the two other sisters disapprove of, of her her version of things because she's crazy and like those yeah. things are weird and that people don't want to face one, right? She's experimental. She's yeah. too avant-garde. She's not giving people what they want. She's like broadcasting to to them like something that's like too challenging and without that's not moored. The word more comes up a lot in this section, which goes back to Weathering Heights in some degree. Like there's a lot of Weathering Heights like references word level here, which are very interesting and like very specifically placed so that when that comes up next section, like it's not going to be a surprise and it'll tie some of these things thematically together, I believe. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what to say besides agreeing with you. <laughs> the last part then is the blowjob joke. Just, I've heard that um, I've heard that joke. I've heard that joke before. Have you heard it before this? Oh my god. Um the, okay, so we have a question. Uh, <laughs> we have a question from the audience asking if we coordinated how many buttons we'd undo in our shirts. And the answer is yes. We all undo <laughs> the number of buttons beforehand. We made sure that it was all yeah, do it, Brian. Undo that button. Take it off. Um, take it all, take it all off. I've got a new neighbor that never wears a shirt. Oh, I oh know. that's not good. It, whoever that is, I love it's across from me. Yeah, it's awesome. I've decided that since there's no so, hat anymore, I don't need to wear anything. Like when I walk around, the yeah, house, not necessary. Me. There's no one on the street. So, like, do you think this is a little hint then on, um, maybe not so subtle hint on 126? When, um, before we get to our Mr. Gorky or whatever his name is. Um, nobody listens to him uh, talking about her brother. Um, nobody listens to him firing blanks, bleeding sheep that refuse to jump over the fence of insomnia, a rant to be delivered. Like that, that it's on uh, it's on 126 on the bottom paragraph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, it's right. like something that you could easily read over, but then in this context that we're speaking of, it becomes very, like, exhibit R, you know, whatever. Right, and that's that's that yeah, like that's his little brilliance of how much stuff is just hiding right out in the open, which you yeah. know, it's a, a, a trick Nabokov is admired for. I mean, yeah, again, mm -hmm. these two, they just they really live side by side in my level of they're just uh, doing things that other people are not even beginning to touch. And like I love what I love about that line, Brian, that, that I paid attention to was the um, <clears throat> the definition of like the voice. A rant. So firing blanks, bleeding sheep that refuse to jump over the fence of insomnia. Insomnia is going to be real key here. <laughs> oh yeah. A rant yes. to be delivered, if possible, in a kind of aristocratic and decadent and swampy lingua with bourbon or vodka or chewing tobacco or snuff on the breath. Like that is like the rant being delivered through those criteria is so wonderful. Like. Yeah, I love it. I don't. I don't have any more unbuttons. Unbutton, man. I, <laughs> I can. I can start unbuttoning the shirts. Buttons. <laughs> Anyone who's listening to this, watch <laughs> on YouTube because you're gonna get. You're gonna get something. Like we're all in isolation. You might <laughs> we're all going a little crazy. Little something. Little. Oh. Little visual satisfaction. And then the, you know what I'm saying. And then so, with the talk of there's a few mentions of Stella and her disease. Um, the disease that she has is it the the paleness and the inability for the, the, like the the need to stay in darkness. It's referenced on page two, 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 two. like there's a, there's like the funny joke on twenty seven, right? The voice of Stephen Hawking, Oscar oh. for best disease. I was um, really will nervous. There be a, <laughs> will there be a film about Stella? Um, Stella de Orr's disease? Tricky, if not impossible, because it would have to be a film of total darkness in which not even the projector beam would light up. All right, like, but it, it mentions in a couple of places as well, but. Um, yeah, so 129 references the disease, of, I don't know. Whatever, someone else say it. It's like yeah, yeah. 12 lines down. Um, that for for me being for me being Stella de Orr, emerged emerging and being touched by the sunlight is an absolute impossibility. Because were I exposed to its rays, my skin, ravaged by the pincers of cancer, would fall from my bones. And their bodies, people who have this disease, tend, don't tend to live past 20. And their bodies end up crisscrossed with marks and ulcers, so that they're brought up under invisible lashes, tracing a map that doesn't lead to any treasure. And I don't have a single freckle or mole anywhere in my skin, which is what you referenced before. I wonder if that's like, 
what kind of, you could read a lot of metaphors into that too, to take a Nabokovian sort of approach of like the untouched, unblemished versus the written upon by the world and like mm. permanent mark sort of idea that she is like, she is like a clean sheet. She's like a pure dream. She's a pure untouched skin, untouched human that like if, if you pay attention to her, if you shine a light on her, it destroys her. She's a dream that if you if you if you look at it goes away. I'm trying to tap into your so, brain, Patrick. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to associate that with the way that Penelope in the invented part really seemed to live in the shadows of of um, the the author and yeah. um, feel. She was the birder in the attic. She was the woman in the attic. She was the left behind. She was the 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 nothing. And now you have Stella D'Or be, you know, the opposite of in the shadows, be all light, all visibility. Um, or not, sorry, no, no, have to be in the shadows, right? She can't have light, but she is pure. And then also, um, like the part of the reason I've been having trouble uh, replying to Chad's ideas is it keeps on wanting to make me go later in the book, what I remember later in the book. And that part of that is her being a successful author. Yeah. What? Trying to, yeah, I'm trying to keep all those spoilers off. I know. I know. I mean, it's giving everyone the tools, I hope. Yes. Okay. I haven't thought of. But then, so yeah, so then we get our, our blowjob joke. You could probably tell this best, Brian. Uh, I'll paraphrase it. Yeah. Um, so... My favorite part of it Somebody's, is that, like makes it feel like it's going to be about the moon landing being fake. Yeah, they, they set up it's going to be fake. And, yeah, um, yeah, like they make and it, there's like a double setup too, where you know holier than thou um, Buzz Aldrin is taking a piss in his spacesuit, and so it's like messing up the way he speaks, right? So it's giving you some body part humor, just to kind of just like another primer for it, but. Somewhere we can hear on the uh, transcripts. If you go back and listen, it you, you can hear "Congratulations, Mr. Gorski," and it has the C CIA, NS, NSA, FBI, NASA. They're all trying to figure out who the fuck is Gorski. What is this? What does this all mean? And really, all it was is when um, growing up in Wampanoag, Ohio, um, Neil Armstrong got his ball in the backyard somewhere, and of his neighbor, and he went to go get it, and he. He overheard um, Mrs. Gorski yelling at Mr. Gorski. She says, "Blowjob! You're gonna get a blue. I won't give you a blowjob until that Neil Armstrong kid lands on the moon or whatever." <laughs> and so, you know, ta-da! Congratulations. <laughs> that, um, that's that, the joke. That joke was told by the brother. Um, What's his name? I forgot. Birdie. 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 Yeah, Birdie. Um, who like takes over? So after we have Eddie's long like beautiful thing about the desert and and being on the moon and the, all that we could get into but we don't have time for maybe we'll revisit later but um after all that then we have uh Brady come over and just take the microphone and be like hey i'm crazy i'm gonna tell you a story i'm gonna tell you about neil armstrong like if there's one character i relate to in this book it's the uh, idiot brother yeah the idiot brother who's like high on moon juice and like I'm <laughs> telling dick jokes like that's from green percent from green and it's remember the we had the green cow milk and now you have the green the green potato vodka so we need to we need to make moon juice a moon man uh moon man juice okay. drink for this book okay we'll come up we'll come up with something so anyways so we've gone pretty long um do you guys have a favorite line that you want to share i've got one for you patrick i want to start because i don't want you to steal my line I want it okay. to be 100% dedicated to Patrick Smith, <clears throat> unbuttoned and all. For every, for every, you should unbutton the button for every part of this that you like. And it's so easy to lie to a dog, and it's impossible to lie to a cat. And that's why parents, in general, choose dogs and not cats as pets for their children. Because parents lie a lot to their children, and then children lie to their parents. <laughs> <laughs> It, it it can be hard to like, tell a good lie to a dog. Mm. Mm. Simple lies like fake throwing a ball is easy, but there's I, I a little bit the other day where like my I've been working on that like stand up bit about not liking dogs for God knows how many years, and there's always like little fractions to it. But I think the new one is that the new beginning is that when we talk about feeling crappy, we always say that we feel like dog shit. We never say <laughs> we feel like cat shit. 
we feel like dog shit. And I think it's because subconsciously we realize that dogs are disgusting, filthy animals and that we don't want to feel like they're shit because their shit's gross. Like we don't want to, we feel like we can, human shit seems better than dog shit. Dog shit's so much worse than human shit. But you would never be like, hey man, I feel like cat shit. Cause someone would be like, what? You're like a hard rock? Like you're a little hard rock? No, you're a filthy, disgusting, oozing thing that's shitting out itself. Chad's anti-dog and now we've lost all our viewers. No, I'm uh, none of what you said is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love dogs, but everything you said tracks. So fair, fair. Fine. <laughs> Favorite line from either of you? Um, um, as a couple I could pick. I did think about that one, but I'm gonna um go with this one uh, on the top of 137. You remember a story faster and better than a name or a bright spot twinkling through light pollution and atmospheric disturbance and better. Why try to find a scientific explanation when you've got emotional motivations for the instability of the moods and concentration of those who inhabit the celestial firmament. Um, I picked it cause it's just a time it's one, a time where there's some pretty sounds in that sentence that I liked. Um, but he also is touching all, all the things he plays with. Like he does dismiss scientific explanation here, but he's all, he's seeking out scientific explanations throughout this. He's there's times he's giving the science behind something and then dropping it and moving on. And also, um, cause as smart as this book is, as funny as book, the best book is as beautiful. It is, there's serious emotional content to both of these books. Like there is a wounded beating heart at, at these books that makes them more than just an intellectual game. And, I, I like that. that. That came up last week with like the subtle this. I do want to mention though, Patrick, that if you um if you play Touch of Grey by Grateful Dead, as you read that passage, it maps out exactly. Okay. I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> I am gonna go on a walk and listen to like uh, a live show after this, probably. There so. you go. Do it. <laughs> if you take a live show and the reading of, of the dream part and play them, they they synchronize perfectly. <laughs> I believe you. It's like a lava lamp. What what show though? Cornell seventy seven. <laughs> sure, I don't know. And Brian says yes, so yes. What's your line, Brian? Uh, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, just feels fitting for the ending of the night and the times we're in. Rest in peace, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Gorski, and Mrs. Gorski, and congratulations to all of us who remain. And good night to all of you, including my love, wherever she may be. Nice. Very nice. So and stop sending me hentai, Chad. I'm not into it. Oh, come on. Come on. I'm waiting for the good night and good luck. Hornbach <laughs> is one of my Zoom classes. That'll be. <laughs> oh, God. These times, man. These times. So these tomorrow. Times. Tomorrow, next week, next week, we're going to be covering pages 156 to 202. And I believe Rachel Cordesco is going to join us. Cool. Those. Oh, Excellent. She is at home with three children. Um, for oh, that sounds awful. <laughs> so if you think I'm afraid, <laughs> we'll be totally together. She's going to look like a genius and like totally a saint and like all set. And I'm going to be at the end of my rope like usual. So. Anyways, Brian, you want to plug your book or anything? Nah, nobody's gonna read it, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, joy time, joy, joy time kill box. You can get it on Amazon with a side of flu. Go ahead and get it yeah. there. Or if you want it to be clean and unblemished, you can get it from a local bookstore and have them hand deliver it to you. So do that. Joy, joy, joy time kill box available wherever books are sold. Right on, Patrick. Plug something. Uh, plug, plug the go. Book. Check out the long list for the best translated book award on the millions today. Read some of those books. Uh, we need a couple more people to write some while those books win posts. Not very many, but uh, if there's a book on there you love, uh, get in touch and, and see if you, it's one of the ones that still needs someone to write on. Otherwise, just read those books. It's a great list. The jury's brilliant. Every year, the jury kicks ass, and it's awesome. I'm proud of them. I would like to, I would like to instead of plugging something, say, I don't care about the Indie Next list anymore. Um, and you should buy books through bookshop.org, but buy only books that aren't on there. Um, so do that. <laughs> I also like that. <laughs> I, yeah, that's all I'm going to do. I watch, I've been watching old movies. I watched Sunset Boulevard the other night. That was interesting. I recommend watching that movie if you're looking for something that's pre-apocalyptic. 
nice. It's a good movie. Also, my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time now is Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, which if anyone knows what I'm talking about, you're going to be like, what the fuck is going on? But I watched that the other night and I think that everyone should watch that movie. It's wonderful. It is a very weird, I have conservatively four hours of material to talk about with that movie. So go forth, read books, read the invented the dream part. I don't even know what we're doing anymore. We'll do that next Wednesday. I've got another Zoom meeting right now. So have fun. Bye. Bye.